Let's go. Hello, it's Lan Nagati, a member of Longland Cares and founder of Food Secure Future, a place for people of all ages and backgrounds to share ideas and learn about the most pressing food security issues. I'm here today with a special guest, Dr. Patrick Webb, who has too many accomplishments to list, but to name a few, he is the Alexander McFarland Professor of Nutrition at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University. He was the Chief of Nutrition for the United Nations World Food Program. And he's currently the director of the United States Agency for International Development, Feed the Future Nutrition Innovation Lab. Hello, Dr. Webb, and thank you for joining us today. Hello, Dr. And, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a mouthful, uh, but I'm very happy. To be here. Yeah. So today I'd like to discuss how the experience of food security has damaging effects on the individual and community level beyond hunger. Mm-hmm. So my first question for you today is, you've stated that, and I'm paraphrasing, In all my years of working on food insecurity, it's not just the hunger dimension. It's the things that wrap around hunger that make the experience of food insecurity so damaging at the individual, household, and community level. Could you elaborate on how food insecurity extends beyond hunger? Sure. So hunger, it's not a scientific word, right? It's it's really an evocative description of the state of of being, an extended lack of food. And it's hard to measure because everyone's going to have a different experience of hunger. Although more of it is the same, a need to eat. All of us humans need to eat, uh, ideally, every day. You know, that's just how we're made. And when you can't eat every day, when you eat too little in a day, then you experience uh, sensations like the tightening of your stomach, pain, anxiety. But anxiety is the link to food food insecurity. So hunger is something that is immediate. Uh, it's happening uh, because you've skipped meals or you've cut back on meals or you've gone several days without food for whatever the reason. Conflict from the ground, ground. Who knows what the reason. But food insecurity goes beyond the immediate to the future a sense of even if I'm not immediately hungry today, where am I going to get food tomorrow and the next day? next week, next month. So it's about anxiety. It's about fear of what's about to happen. Uh, it's about concern, perhaps, of a mother for their child. How am I going to feel feed my child? Uh, it's concern about what <clears throat> that, that impending hunger may require me to do. How am I going to think if I have, even if I have money, but if I have no money or prices are too high, uh, what's that going to require me to do? Go begging? Go uh, asking for help from strangers? You know, sex work? What is it? What, you know, so a lot of anxiety and potentially shame is attached to not just feeling hunger today, but feeling food insecure. And obviously, food insecurity uh, can happen at any time, but it tip- if it's going to happen in a community, it's not just one families usually experience that it will be multiple families because the the thing that's causing this is affecting many people at once again conflict, dread, disease. So, and so if many people in a community suddenly were slowly thrust into this, this anxiety this fear then social bonds can break down and it can have long-lasting effects for the whole community and countryside around Right. Yeah, it's more than something that's just an immediate feeling. It's really affecting their whole life and their lifestyle. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, some of us experience hunger intentionally, like fasting, right? mm-hmm. fasting for a day, fasting for a month during the day and so on. But at the end of the day, there's people who fast intentionally usually are not food insecure. They're not worried that when they stop fasting, there will be. So it's a very unintentional, food, something that is thrust upon you. Hence the anxiety, the fear, the shame, the crippling sense of uncertainty mm-hmm. about where my meal, my baby's meal will come from. Yeah. Yeah. So you actually mentioned a little bit of this for my next question, but um, my next question is, what are some of the multifaceted impacts that food insecurity can have on social cohesion within communities? Mm-hmm. Well, this, yes. I mean, it's important to realize that, you know, the old saying, it takes a village. Well, in many, it may take a neighborhood in urban areas or you know, whether it doesn't matter whether you're in Africa or Arkansas. The, this thing, food insecurity, can, can be very damaging at 
community level, um, because uh, not just the immediate cause, whatever that cause is, it could have been the shock of Hurricane Katrina, Louisiana, it could, have, it could be the fighting that's going on in the Middle East. But whatever the cause, if people are afraid of where they're going to get the next meal, then more people are going to be asking their neighbors, their friends, their extended family for help, maybe to share from the group, to, to share money. Or they may be asking asking money like for, look, I need a loan. I can't afford it because prices have gone because everyone's looking for the same loaf of bread. And social bonds of friendship and even kinship can be affected by this when several people start coming to me asking for help, but I'm actually also looking for help at the same time. You'd rather keep the door shut, not open it, not have to answer to uh, whether it's friends or relatives. And then the relationship with employers and employees gets affected. Can I have an advance on my salary? No, you can't. Well, why not? You can't afford food. You know, so all dimensions of life that relate to resource access, uh, food access, and a peace of mind that I get stretched often to their breaking point. And in history, this has been seen so many, so many, so many times where when large numbers of people go, start going hungry, you can have riots on the street, you can have breakdown of social order, and uh, things can get very bad. Yeah, it's really a ripple effect where it's going to affect every single part of your life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So my next question for you is, you've stated that charity is not a solution to world hunger. Can you elaborate on this statement? Sure. That is no, not intended to be a disparaging remark about charity. Yeah. I firmly believe in uh, people giving they can, when they can, to help others who are needed. That's not the point. My point is that the solution to hunger and food insecurity has to be systemic, has to be structural. Uh, it, it can't be done on a case-by-case basis. The breakdown of social norms in the context of famine or food insecurity are always ultimately because government policies have failed or government policies have not been put into place in the first place, appropriately, and or the markets have failed. There's people rely either on the market, going to buy food, purchase food, food sell food, and so on, or on government structures, safety nets, emergency food programs, pension funds, and so on. If either of those are not organized well, funded well, implemented well, then you get an increasing risk of food security. So at the end of the day, it's fixing systemic challenges across society, which means at the government level, at the policy level, uh, which means the marketplace, so involving the private sector, ensuring that you have adequate roads and you have good information flows where the prices of food are higher or lower in parts of the country and so on. Um, that's how you're going to get start reducing and get a handle on hunger and food security, not a case by case basis that addresses the symptoms. Yeah. So you actually perfectly segue me into my next question. Uh, in your experience, what role can policymakers play in fostering a culture of food security and social justice? Yeah, you know, some countries, some governments are more concerned and attuned to these kinds of issues than others. Um, Particularly in Europe, uh, some countries in in Asia who have emerged from years of food insecurity, some countries in Africa that have faced famine and are trying to prevent that from happening again. Um, Ultimately, it's what's required is a form of social contract between citizens and the governments, those who govern those citizens, where Citizens do have to have, use their voice, which is a powerful tool, uh, to demand and ensure that you know, no one can go to bed hungry. You know, it's an outrage. It should be a political priority, but it's not in many places. And so the electorate citizens have to hold their uh, government, their politicians accountable. Um, so do civil society organizations that operate on behalf of people, groups of populations. So do political parties. It does wax and wane. When in 2008 and then 2012 and then again in 2018, food prices spiked around the world. You saw lots of spikes. Then suddenly you see a resurgence of conversations. Oh my gosh, we've got to look 
address food insecurity and, and prevent people from going hungry. Hungry, but then when those prices fall again, uh, the conversation stop until the next. Time. And ideally, what we need to do is educate policymakers to to fix the problem, not just to keep reacting to the next problem because you didn't do enough last time around. Yeah, why do you think that maybe it's so like people don't care about it? The policymakers don't focus on it as much. Ah, well, now that's a whole series of questions, isn't it? Um, at the end of the day, it's competing priorities mm -hmm. and competing resources, like everything in government. Um, you know, you have some parties that are more focused on the well-being of people. You have other parties more concerned with. Honestly, the well-being of the economy and the ability to make profit. Other parties who are more concerned about the state of the planet, climate change, and so on. At the end of the day, it shouldn't be either or, or my priorities better than your priorities more important. All, these are all important priorities. Um, but somehow, hunger and food insecurity, they're fundamental. They're basic, right? People need to eat to be healthy, educated, and productive but somehow that gets lost and it's in many countries in many cultures uh, it's basically because it's left to the individual families the families to make sure there's food on the table when yes of course there's a certain responsibility uh, but if there's systemic inequity in access to jobs income or even food or education then some people was going to be better able to feed their families than others and on it I personally believe it's a government's duty to ensure that no one and that they should be putting in place remedial or protective system policies and programs uh, to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, and again, some places do take this more seriously than others. You just have to keep keep voicing this as a priority for individuals, for people, for culture, uh, and holding people accountable. I mean, it's partly about education, um, but it's it's also about being being willing to stand up for what is right and that's almost a small p political agenda. yeah completely agree with you all right so final question for you today is what strategies do you believe uh, are most effective in educating future generations about food insecurity and empowering them to take action mm. well we are actually seeing almost a renaissance of young people's interest in what what is a healthy diet I would say the past 20, 30 years have been quite negative. Diets have shifted and not always in good ways around the world. And, but I'm seeing everywhere from Bangladesh to Bolivia to Boston, um, young people, influencers, you know, obviously influence social media is, plays a huge role in this, but not just for, oh, here's what I'm eating today, how it started, but young people having a voice like you saying this is an important issue here's what i know about it here's how you can learn more right? and so what you're doing is, a, is an excellent example but more and more people need to understand that what you you are what you positively and negative and that allowing everyone access to a healthy diet that's produced sustainable for planetary health and human health uh, should be a common goal across the world across all culture so this is a time when youth in particular uh, need to connect with each other and now it's possible through not just social media but uh, through the internet but basically building up the strength of a united voice around issues that really really matter so over time some of the best influencers of future generations are going to be your generation and your generation's children i'm quite optimistic quite positive about this being a, a force for good uh, in this space as in many other spaces like environment and climate change. Yeah. All right. Well, is there anything else you want to add? That's all for me. Good. No, I um, appreciate you uh, reaching out and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you.